love my HBCU. And Bob, Bob? I love it, love it. Yeah. I love it, love it. Yeah. I love my HBCU. Yeah. And man, man, I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man, I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I tune into the HCCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, she tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, he know what he be talking about. Mike and Charles, they know what they be talking about. They compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they won a loss. Yeah, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes, sir. and pay attention, Boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Mike Washington is out on assignment. So I have A.D. Drew Wilson Jackson, the second in the house. And I just want to say welcome to episode 565 of Inside the HBCU Sports Lab radio show and podcast. The show that's covering the sporting HBCU dash for all things HBCU sports from institutions large and small. From the NAIA to the NCAA, we share insights and information on the HBCU sports culture. HBCU Athletic Aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBCU Athletic Programs and the business of HBCU Sports. Simply put, we just call it the Sports Pedagogy. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, along with my co-host, Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Well, we're from, from filming some of these guys from the home hotel. <laughs> Other guys from the hotel, like myself, mine happens to be in California. It's Indian Wells, California at the resorts over here. I'm here for Padre, the Dean's conference, getting a lot of good information, but you see that uh, it's pretty nice, so I get a chance to kind of set in the good sights. Uh, y'all messing up my pool time, though, so I, I need to make sure you're <laughs> going. <laughs> With that being said, I uh, hope all's doing well, and I just wanted to give a little spotlight and showcase, and sometimes you're blessed uh, beyond your measures, uh, you put work hard, you do things, and it works out in your favor. So um, just getting a chance uh, to do do the work as we do the work, we're in a good position where we get to really see some good sights around the country and take up things. So it's nice to see what that looks like. With that being said, let me go to you, Charles. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Busy all weekend, of course. Uh, call that uh, Texas Southern Southern game has been the talk of HBCU uh world but uh it's been a busy weekend and i'm looking forward to this upcoming weekend jack state fan we got some great games on tap and then oh uh, man we'll get to it in, into the news a lot of great games that'll be on to tv now you act like you're looking forward to a game this weekend is there something that i hadn't heard about that you can share with us uh yeah i'm uh, slightly looking forward to a game this weekend my uh, you know it's always fun when you get a chance to fly home for the weekend so i'm a <laughs> Fly home and catch a game, if you will. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go to you, Wilton Jackson, the second while you are on the road in hotel, living that hotel life like me. Um, not sure your accommodation is quite like mine, but, you know, so is life. Yeah, no, nah, that's true. You know, you keep pushing, you keep going through it. But, no, nah, uh, I'm good. I'm, I'm glad to be able to, you know, talk talk some more football and, like you said, just do the work. Sounds like you know a little something about a big game this weekend for you, uh, yourself. I do. Yeah, it's, it's no secret. Jack, 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 Jackson State fam, you in Jackson, uh, you know, everybody will be watching. Yeah. It sounds as we go around the horn, for lack of better terms, it sounds like a refrain. I wonder if uh, Drew uh, has a little bit of knowledge about the uh, big game this weekend as well. How you doing, Drew? I, I do, but I'm bringing it in from the Drew. So we got all these uh, Jackson State folk uh, on here. <laughs> Z I I can't even say it this week. Man. <laughs> Hell no, I'm not even gonna say it this week. <laughs> and and uh, for all those who have not, for all those who have not figured it out, Doctor Cavill has figured it out. You know, 
professionals vacation by going to conferences. I, you know, an extra day at the front end of the conference, extra day at the back end of the conference. Same thing. Wilton's starting to figure it out and everything, but he, he just picked the wrong city to go to this time, man. I mean, yeah, you know. I, I need I need to be with Dr. Cavill at, for sure. Exactly. Doc got Doc got it 100% right. Got the conference, <laughs> got the dates, and got the, got the city with it, man. <laughs> When I grow up, I want to be like Doc. That's all. <laughs> That's all of us. Right. So, well, you know, the focus today will be on the mid-major poll rankings because we will release them as we do now every Tuesday. Uh, but the matchup that you all are talking about features two top 25 teams and two top five teams in the poll ranking as Dr. Drill inside the HBC Sports Lab did uh, this past Sunday. We did the major division. So we have the number three team, which is also the number 18 team. Florida A&M Rattlers travels to Jackson State to face the number four team in my poll ranking. Uh, and that is also ranked number 25, the Jackson State Tigers. Uh, that ranking is the NCAA Division I FCS top 25 rankings uh, in terms of all FCS programs. And you have actually three HBCUs is ranked. There's North Carolina Central is ranked as well. Um, and Central is ranked number one in my poll ranking. So interesting when you talk about that. We'll get to some of these mid-majors, so they're looking good. They have some big matchups this weekend, which we certainly will get to. Um, that's in the SIEC. CIAA continues to show us the love, and they find a way to make sure we have good rankings over there as well. Uh, as we get into it and kind of finish up this first segment, let me go to you, Charles, and give some updates on some superlatives. Who, what is some news out there in terms of who showed out this past week? Yeah, let's take a look at the SWAC Football Weekly Honors. The SWAC has tabbed Alabama a and Xavier Langford, Alabama State's Kareem Keys, Alcorn State's to Marion Edwards, Prairie View A&M's Guillermo Garcia Rodriguez, and Arkansas Pine Bluffs Giovanni Gibson for SWAC Football Weekly Honors for their outstanding performances this past week. Let's take a look at the co-offensive players of the week. Xavier Langford, he accounted for four touchdowns, three rushing, and one passing. And Alabama A&M's 56-12 homecoming victory over Bethune Cookman. He went 15 of 24 passing for 315 yards and then added 73 yards on the ground as well uh, with those three touchdowns. The other call offensive player of the week was Kareem Keyes. He entered the game off the bench to help the Hornets erase a 14-0 early deficit against Mississippi Valley in the 54-17 win over Valley. Trailing 14-0, the Hornets outscored Valley 54-3 over the final three-plus quarters as Keyes tossed Four touchdown passes while completing 14 of 21 passes for 326 yards. Defensive player of the week was Stamarian Edwards from Alcorn. He finished with 12 tackles on the night and hot that were highlighted by two and a half tackles for losses during the Braves 17 to 14 win over Grandma. His tackles for losses accounted for seven yards on the night while he also recorded an interception and a quarterback heard. Specialist Garcia, he connected on field goal attempts of 50. 54 and 49 this past week during Purview uh, game against Arkansas Pine Bluff. His successful 54 yard attempt was the longest made field goal attempt in the conference this season. And the newcomer of the week is Giovanni Gibson from Arkansas Pine Bluff. Impressive performance against Purview this past Friday. Tallied nine receptions for 183 yards and one touchdown. It was the fourth game this season that Gibson registered over 140 yards receiving. So those are your sweat. Players of the week. Oh, that's good stuff. Shout out to the SWAT players of the week. I don't know if y'all were like me, but caught an eye early on that Alabama State Valley game and Valley went up 14 0. You was like, hmm. Mm. Again, things certainly. And then it happened. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Valley Valley. <laughs> and then it happened. <laughs> what? Let me go to you, Wilton, and give me some superlatives. What's going on in the MEAC for those football players that showed up and showed out this week? So the MIA had another great group of players to uh, show out this week. Uh, you had Howard quarterback Deshaun Scroggins was named the MIAC Offensive Player of the Week. Uh, Norfolk State linebacker A.J. Richardson earned Defensive Player of the Week honors, while teammate Vincent Berry was named the Rookie of the Week. And North Carolina Central's Trevon Humphrey and Kayla Robeson received Offensive Lineman and Specialist of the Week honors. Uh, Scroggins completed 17 of 29 passes for 153 yards in the Bison's 21-14 win over Sacred Heart. He had 85 yards on the ground, including a go-ahead rushing touchdown to secure Howard's victory. Uh, Richardson ready for 18 tackles with seven solo stops, including five and a half tackles for loss of 20 yards. 
Uh, Richardson added two sacks of 12 yards and one interception of 32 yards in the Spartans game against Townsend. Richardson was also named the Stat Perform FCS National Defensive Player of the Week. Bear recorded 221 yards, completing 16 of 31 passes, including a 43-yard touchdown pass in the Spartans' 28-23 loss to Townsend. Uh, Barry averaged 13.81 yards per completion. Humphrey recorded a 96% grade on his blocking assignments with one pancake block en route to leading the Eagles to 439 yards of total offense and 326 yards rushing. He didn't allow a sack or gain a penalty for the Eagles. Robinson registered 11 kickoffs totaling 679 yards with a 61.7 average with six touchdowns. And those are your MIAC players of the week. Shout out to the MIAC players of the week showing up and showing out as they did their thing. Only a couple of games that uh, last week really looks slim this week as they get prepared to go into MIAC play, but we'll get into that as we discussed on Sunday. Again, we'll focus a little more on the mid majors. With that being said, let me go to AD Drew and see what's on his mind for the HBCU News of the Week. See, I'm like EF Hutton, y'all. Y'all remember that commercial when EF Hutton talks? Everybody listen. listen. Yeah. <laughs> so when AD Drew tell y'all that it's, that an emerging sport is going to take off, go ahead and go ahead and invest your listen. stock in them. Y'all better listen to them. Uh, I started talking about this two years ago. I mentioned this uh, every now and then on some podcasts. Uh, guys know how I've been talking about this behind the scenes. But the CIAA announced that they will be adding women's flag football to mm-hmm. seven member institutions mm-hmm. beginning in spring 2025. Those seven institutions include Bluefield State, Bowie State, Claflin, Fayetteville State, Johnson C. Smith, Virginia Union, and West, uh, excuse me, Winston-Salem State. The CIA appreciates the commitment and support from these institutions in introducing women's flag football as part of their athletic programs. The new venture not only promotes female participation in sports, but also aligns with the NCAA consideration of women's flag football as an emerging sport in the coming year. Uh, Women's flag football will feature an average roster size of 25 players, with the games played on a seven in a seven on seven format, each contest was consist of four 12 minute quarters on an 80 by 40 field. The growth of flag football has received significant backing from the NFL. Arthur Blank is one of the major backers, uh, owner of the Atlanta Falcons, uh, which has utilized numerous NFL facilities and stadiums for competitions and clinics. NFL players have actively engaged with young athletes to foster interest. In the sport this past year alone, over 700,000 youth athletes participate in NFL flag leagues with nearly 500,000, that's a half million, y'all, of those being females. 13 states now have uh, flag football sanctioned as a high school uh, as a high school sport. So, uh, you know, I, I've been trying to tell y'all that, that it was coming. We know Alabama State. Was uh was added it on. I believe they're supposed to launch this year. Uh, Florida Memorial started their program. I believe it was two years ago when they started their program, and uh, it, it is big on the NAIA level already. NCAA is a little bit late to the party. They're trying to bring it in, and I've you know I've seen some nice uh, athletes uh, out there because I've seen many a flag women's flag football games and. I, I'm telling you, it it is fun. It's it's yeah. It, it it's a fun atmosphere watching women's flag football. Uh, watching watching those young ladies compete. You, I have you a cousin who's uh, cousin who's playing uh, flag football on for her high school team uh, on the East Coast. So uh, we had a tremendous time watching it out there. So. Yeah, uh, yeah. Get, you got to get down to the state of Florida. N- no offense to anybody else, but Florida was like the first high school. Uh, First state that's sanctioned in high school, and some of the athletes that I have seen watching games or teams from Florida. Oh my God! You know, you you <laughs> think you got all? You think you think uh, they put some athletes with, with some tackle football? Mm-hmm. You got to see the athletes that come out on the women's side and flag football out of the state of uh, Florida. And I'll tell you one last thing. I'll tell you whose daughter uh, plays football. Y'all might have heard of her daddy. Uh, somebody by the name of Vic. I can't remember his first mm-hmm. name. Oh, Mike. 
Mike mm. Vick, yeah, his his daughter it, it talk about somebody who can't can't, can't uh, be caught. She she plays receiver, but she's the backup quarterback, and a lot of times they just wind up going here putting her in the quarterback because she is the best athlete on the team that she plays for at uh, Point University. Mm. Nice, great information. And I do recall when you first put it out there, the only surprise I had was it was the CIAA because I thought the MIAC was looking at maybe trying to push open the door first. Maybe they still not finished, or it'd be interesting. You end up having two conferences. But uh, AD Drew led this out there uh, from the exposure and said, hey, it's coming. And I don't think people understood how big it was at the high school level in terms of what Drew was witnessing. And certainly to hear that it's coming to an HBCU conference near you, I think it's fascinating, great news. With that, let's take our first break. We'll come back on the other side, and it's time to release the mid-major poll rankings, Charles. Mid-major poll rankings will be released today. Let's see what your thoughts are All you do on what happens after this break. Hey, grab me one, too. A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCF Team Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSN Sports Wrap, YouTube at MyJBN Online, and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network's app. Make sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. This is the Dean of the College of HBCU Sports, Kenyatta Cavill of Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Come mix it up in the lab where the course lecture is in session every Tuesday from 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live, YouTube, Spreaker, or the BCSN app. As we discuss all things about the HBCU sports culture, including exploring the week that was in the sporting HBCU dash as well as the upcoming week of HBCU Sports. With me, the Dean, the College of HBCU Sports, on Dr. Cavill's Inside HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Watts and Charles Bishop. Course lecture dismissed. Choice Hotels is a family of brands that helps you get the most for your money so you can be any traveler you want to be. You could be a free hot breakfast hero in a comfort hotel. Yes! That's how you waffle! Mr. This Script got a plot twist at a Radisson Hotel. A business big leaguer! Go for key. Even the ultimate pool float inflator. With 22 brands and the best value for your money, Choice Hotels has a stay for any you. Book direct at choicehotels.com, where travels come true. Got to get the corners. When you're looking for the latest information on Southern University Sports, the Southwestern Athletic Conference, and HBCU Athletics, there's only one place to go. Tune in to The Carlos Brown Show, exclusively on the Black College Sports Network. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they're going to tell you if your team, if they want a lot of laugh and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir, yes, and pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Charles Bishop, A.D. Drew, and Wilton Jackson the second, uh, as he is on the move getting stuff done. Uh, moving around like all the folks, man, all of y'all are now like entering into this next level of your craft. I'm really excited, proud of you in all seriousness. I'm like, man, look at these. I just got stellar people around you. That's how you become great. So you get great people around you. You get a piece of that greatness as well. With that being said, let's talk about some of these great teams, at least those great teams in week six. Those, as we recognize, great will be the top seven. We'll talk a little bit about if anybody dropped out. We'll see those receiving votes. So we'll look at 10 HBCU mid-major programs in week six and see what does the world encapsulate, encapsulate this week in terms of what's going down. So dropping out this week is Shaw Bears. They finally ran into a little buzzsaw as they dropped down. 
They're listed as four, uh, th four and three, two and two, as they are in the mix, uh, shooting things around. Getting into receiving votes, Fort Valley State Wildcats. Uh, they quietly have snuck back into the mix. That early loss to Clark Atlanta doesn't look as bad as they've improved a four and two over and all. Uh, three and one in the conference race, 118 points. So they're looking just outside of the top seven. Shaw Bears are three and three, two and two, 117 points as they continue to move in the mix as well. Actually, four and three, two and two, I should say. Finally, just inside that is Virginia State. The Trojans sit at three and three, two and one. They did get the victory, uh, but a couple of losses earlier on in the season. It's still hurting them and preventing them to get in the top seven. But just when you want to put the dirt on them, they say not so fast. But let's get in the top seven. This is another one that A.G. Drew got right. Uh, Drew talked about the fact that uh, with the CIAA playing each other, beating each other up, at some point it was going to mm -hmm. open them. I tried to told y'all. I tried to told y'all. <laughs> <laughs> you have five Golden Bears sitting at four and two. Four and two overall, 121 points. Uh, they were not ranked last week, but because of their big win, they have sole possession of first place in the SIEC, probably more importantly. Uh, but they beat – to do that, they had to defeat a team they were tied with that were both undefeated going into that matchup was Albany State Golden Rams, as we told you about the Masters this past weekend when we did the Sunday show. But with that being said, Miles Golden Bears are in at number seven. At number six, we go back to the – CIAA, just after coming out of the SIAC, it's the CIAA life, as they like to say. CIAA for life. They're five and two, three and one. Livingston Blue Bears quietly surprising everybody. 124 points. They win again. They stay at number six, though, for this week. At number five, Clark Atlanta Panthers, all they do is win. Five, one and one, four and one in conference place now. Went on the road, got a big win, come from behind, as they tend to have made a habit this year, but they find a way to get it done. They have one first-place vote, 137 points. They jumped right back up in the mix after they fell a little bit last week. They were seven. They're back in action at number five as they climb their way back to the top, but they do have a first-place vote. Bringing to the number four, we go back out of the SIC into the CIAA. Once some Salem State Rams sit at five and two, three and one, they're having a really good season. 140 points remaining at number four this week. and looking good as they get it done. Bringing us to number three, the Union Union Panthers. Remember when we thought they were struggling? Mm. Well, yeah, that was many moons ago in the football vernacular in terms of Senate several weeks ago. Now they've gotten it right. They sit at four and two, three and oh, top of the CIAA. One first place vote, 172 points. They come in at number three and stay there. At number two, West Virginia State Yellow Jackets are five and one. They get a win. They're four and zero, 174 points. They lost the first place vote, uh, even though they got it done against Concord. Concord. They stay at number two though, uh, as they continue to move uh, the needle in week number six. Remus number one. As you see, not a lot of changes in the top four, including number one, which is Johnson C. Smith. The Golden Bulls are six and zero, three and zero. They did not play. They have seven first place votes, 198 points, and they remain number one for the six consecutive weeks at number one. That's how long they've gotten it done. They have a command done. We'll see what it looks like when we talk about some matchups next. But for right now, let's see what everybody thinks about the top seven as you see it. Miles Golden Bears, <laughs> Livingston Blue Bears, Clark Atlanta Panthers, Winston Salem State Rams, Virginia Union Panthers, West Virginia State Yellow Jackets, and the Johnson C. Smith Golden Bulls are all your top seven programs in week number six. Let me go to you, Charles. What are your thoughts in terms of the poll ranking for week six in the mid-major? Uh, we just got past midterm, so now we're on to the second half of the semester. Uh -huh. Your thoughts? Uh -huh. <laughs> I like that. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm just, okay, looking, I'm just looking at the bottom of this poll. Uh, four through seven, the bottom about to drop out after this. After this. Damn. I mean, we 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 got a five seven matchup and a four six matchup. I, that that. Ooh. <laughs> and then waiting in the wings is Fort Valley and Shaw. Although Shaw goes to John C. Smith this weekend, 
I, you know, I don't know how that's going to work out, but the bottom is about to drop out of this poll. Now the shakeup is coming. <laughs> we've, we've been waiting on the third Saturday in October for everything to start shaping up and shaking out, and here we are. Yeah, no doubt. Way to uh, set it up with some of those top matchup games that we'll talk about next. And you're absolutely right, man. It's a bonanza this week in mm. terms of big-time matchups. We talked about coming into it leading the way, but we told you without further ado, make sure you give some love to the mid-majors because they have some top seven matchups as well. Top ten one is on the list when we take in number one in those receiving votes. With that being said, let me go to you, Winston Jackson the second. What do you say about week number six in the mid-major poll with the top seven? Well, Charles kind of alluded to it. It's definitely going to be some teams that's, that's going to drop out. Uh, as far as, like, the top team, John C. Smith, we know they're number one. Uh, I didn't put West Virginia State that high. I had – We already know you did. I didn't. I did not. <laughs> also, and I want to mention this too, AD Drew, because you were, I think you and somebody else had got on me about having not having Albany State in my top 10 last week and they lost to Mavs. Mm. So I actually I got them in my top 10 this week, but uh they they're well, they're at the bottom, but they're not in my, my, my top seven. But um Clark Atlanta, I had at number four, but I could go for number three. Winston Salem State was pretty much where I thought they would be. Um everybody else seems to be pretty cool. Good stuff, Winston. I like the way you think, moving them around, and you tell us why, where you would like a team and where it is. That's pretty good. But you're not too bad on the poll. You did talk about you didn't have a team in your top seven. Which team was that? Uh, my So my top seven are JC, uh, Johnson C. Smith, Virginia Union, Miles, Clark Atlanta, Winston-Salem State, Virginia State, and West Virginia State. Okay. So you had Good Livingstone stuff. out. I did. Yeah. You don't believe in the blue bears? No. Oh. <laughs> no. No. I do, I, I, I do not. Not right now. Not not coming into this week. No, I do not. <laughs> I was going to say thank you for elaborating, but now I guess I can just say thanks for telling us how you really feel. No. Yes. <laughs> AD Drew, let's go to our D2 specialist in the house and see what he says in terms of the top seven. Uh, you pretty much named it. You must have my computer cheat sheet and all the voter scan cards because you pretty much wrapped it up, said what was going to take place coming into the week, and perfectly as you aligned it, it fits just perfectly for some key matchups at that. But, Drew, what are your final thoughts on the top seven? I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna touch your your top seven, Doctor Cavill, because I really don't have too much to add to it outside of what these two guys have already added. But I do want to bring in the fact that I looked at the uh, early regional rankings and what the, uh, what they ha- where they have everybody at right now. In the regional rankings, everybody, which are the important ones for people getting to the playoffs, right. Joshua C. Smith sits at number three. Virginia Union sits at number number five. Um, Winston-Salem State sits at number eight. And you notice what you notice what I did not call the school at, right? That would be in the SIAC. The highest rated, the highest rated team in the SIAC right now would be Miles at 11, and then Clark Atlanta coming in at 15. Why do I bring that up? For the SIAC's perspective, they need Miles to win this game Saturday against <laughs> Clark Atlanta <laughs> so that they can stay in because Clark Atlanta down at 15, don't know if they're going to come from 15 to try to get into their top seven or the top nine. Yeah. That's a long way to go in three, four weeks. Not saying it's impossible, but it's a lot easier when you're going from 11 and only have to get to number nine. Also, Winston-Salem State, they need to really get to the number six spot because if they're at that number seven spot and a mile should finish nine, they will bump Winston-Salem State out of out of of the playoffs because they take the top seven, but if a conference champion finishes nine, they can bump somebody. Mm. So a lot lot of people need to uh, make sure they understand that. And just for clarity, 
Virginia Union, if they if they should happen to make it, they'll get moved to Super Region One probably. So that's something else that happens. And just so you know, West Virginia State, who is in Super Region One, is sitting at the I believe they're number uh, nine right now in Super Region One. So they have they have a shot to get in also. Eddie, tell me about this conference West Virginia State is in. Yeah, Mount East traditionally is one of the better conferences in Division Two. They uh kind of like the SAC. They always get, they usually get three teams into the uh, Division Two uh into that region. So you know, West Virginia State, if they continue to win out, they can lose to the top uh top team in the conference because they are undefeated in the conference. West Virginia State will get in. So that that's something that we need to know. But yeah, they're a team that always gets a minimum of two bids. Uh, traditionally, they get three bids into the uh, into this into Super Region One, which a lot we don't follow because if West Virginia State's not there. We really don't follow West Virginia State. There are no other HBCUs. There really aren't too many schools that you would even know my name in that particular conference. Uh, PSAC is is the uh, other big conference that is in that super region. And a lot of you all have heard of the PSAC. That's the Pennsylvania uh, conference. Great information there, Drew. Uh, let me ask one follow-up, uh, as Charles did. And uh, see, now y'all know that we're not all that crazy about West Virginia State, if there is some substance to the conference. Uh, but with that being said, whether Miles or Clark Atlanta, if they run the table, Including winning the conference championship with my with Clark Atlanta being so far down, do you think they still can't get to that nine spot? If they went out, Miles probably could. Essentially, what you're saying, my Miles, yes, Clark Atlanta is going to need some help. Got it. Number number one, they're going to have to defeat, for lack of a better word, they would have to defeat a Miles again in the championship game. Possibly a Fort Valley. I think Fort Valley was sitting at like 18 or something like that when I looked at it. But outside of that, uh, they they really won't have a chance. And I've, I've said this for the last three, four weeks. SIAC is in real jeopardy of not having a representative in the Division II playoffs, which brings up even, and, and I'm not going to dwell on this one too long, even more of the reason why we need our own version of the celebration bowl at the division two level because how many years did we see this when it came to the uh came to the uh to, to the big boys yeah yep swag and yeah. swag swag swag, yeah. swag swag didn't get automatic because because of the uh the Thanksgiving weekend games the turkey day and the bayou so they always had to rely on the at large when was the last time the SWAT got that large before Fab you took it? Well, it was almost 20 years before they right. were able to get that at large. MIAC would always go in, get get sent to uh BFE to play their first game, and, and then they and then they'd be home right after Thanksgiving. You know, the MIAC never won in those 10, 15 years when they were trying to get the celebration bowl together. This is more the reason why we need to go ahead, pull out. I'll, in addition to the financial, we all know playoffs don't make money, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and the only two teams that have had a run in the Division Two playoffs, Tuskegee had that run in the uh, mid uh, twenty teens. I want to say like 2015, 2016, when they made Winston, it to the eight, and Winston then we know Salem those State. two years Winston Salem had in uh, twelve and thirteen, mm-hmm. when uh, one of those years they went to the uh, championship game. So. Well, they also the semifinals. I think the semifinals a twelve uh, championship game at thirteen. If I have it correct, I may be yes. off a year with that. But you know, outside of that, you know, Bowie did win one game. Yeah, well, they had that one run where they won the two, went to the lead eight because they had to buy. Right. Yeah, they had to buy. Then they won the game, and then and then and then Valdosta State uh, crossed their path. So right in the lead eight, where it was over. But to your point, I would be surprised if the leadership of the CIAA and SIC in terms of commissioners of looking at finding a way. Obviously, you had a little hint of it in terms of the Florida Beach Bowl. Um, not so sure in terms of that being able to maintain itself, but they it gave you some inkling that there's some synergy. And you also have uh, the, the setup to the preseason where you have the champion of the CIAA and the SIC playing in the Black College Football Hall of Fame game. 
So you see the commissioners are working together from that perspective. Can they find the recipe uh, that allows them to create a championship game? Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, just a quick question because I don't want to get into locations and everything because we'll throw locations around all day. My question would be, if they were able to pull this off, what date would you play it considering everything that we know we have going on? We already know when the Celebration Bowl is. We know when the Swag Championship game is. We know we got the Bayou out there. We know we've got Turkey Day out there. Uh, and traditionally, the uh, SIAC and the CIAA have their championship the second weekend in November. It's the third weekend this year because of the calendar. When would you win? Realistically, when would you play that game? Because I've got my own theory, but I want to hear you guys first. I think that's the toughest question out there. And maybe on the back end of the show, I'll let Charles and Winston maybe give some thought to it as they marinate it over the next two seconds uh, segments. I've had a cheat code, and I was asked to kind of consult and look at the date. My gut, and I'm still playing with the data and the numbers and really looking at the dates, my gut would be to play it on the Friday of Thanksgiving. I know there's some reticence to that when you first hear it, but if you kind of wrap it around uh, the HBCU games that are being played now with the Turkey Day Classic on Thursday, you got the Bay Bayou Classic on Saturday. If you drive it as a television matchup, you can get eyeballs that uh, HBCU fans that are focused and already watching games. You can potentially get some of those eyeballs on Friday. Obviously, I know you got the pro games. But as you get in later in the season, you're going to have to deal with that with it regardless. We already see how that affected uh, moving these SWAC championship games and things of that nature and the bowl season. So I think at this point, my gut would say that Friday uh, in terms of Thanksgiving, we'll see what that looks like. Because I think if you move it around outside after that, you're really in some danger uh, of what that looks like. But we'll get some discussion, put it out there, and the other folks will have their thoughts. Like I said, we'll come back and see Charles and Winston give him a little time to opine on that. Let's take our next segment and come back on the other side, and we'll start talking about some of these big matchups. We'll start with the mid-major matchups, and we'll get a chance to get these guys to give some of their thoughts on the big matchup matchup everybody seems to want to talk about at the major division level, uh, which um, has the games there. We'll be right back after this break. Looking for the ultimate cultural experience of 2025? The Zora Outdoor Festival of the Arts is where you need to be. From January 31st to February 2nd, Eatonville, Florida will come alive with incredible live performances from the Lavert Experience and Sunshine Anderson. Immerse yourself in interactive art. Take a journey through history with a new virtual tour app that brings Eatonville's legacy to life from your phone. Enjoy family-friendly STEM activities and explore over 80 unique vendors. Please don't miss the unforgettable R&B tribute to the legends. This is more than a festival. It's a celebration of Eatonville's rich cultural heritage. Visit ZoraFestival.org for tickets or to become a vendor. We'll see you in Eatonville, the oldest black incorporated municipality in the country. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna love yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir, yes, and pay attention, boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Ville inside HBCU Sports Lab. Let's get into some of these matchups. Let's start in the uh, CIAA. Charles, what are some key matchups? You kind of alluded to it, so I'm going to go to you first and allow you to kind of continue with uh, you saying there are some big matchups in the CIAA this weekend. Obviously, we'll get a chance to talk about that SIEC matchup. These matchups, uh, getting into top seven games that you were alluding to, uh, what are your, what's on your mind when you look at the CIAA uh, in terms of those games? Uh, the first one I was kind of looking at that jumped out to me was uh, as we move in this week uh, seven in terms of these key matchups, would be Winston-Salem State and Livingstone. That gives you a four versus six matchup. Uh, this Livingstone Blue Bears come in at five and two, three and one, really hot team in terms of how they played as late. Winston-Salem State is not too bad themselves. 
uh, and four in the ranking at five and two and three and one. So a lot on the line in terms of not wanting to get in that second loss in conference play as you're getting down the strip and you're trying to fight for a position in the poll rankings. Again, that game is played at 4 p.m. That is Eastern time, 3 o'clock Central time, Salisbury, North Carolina. Charles, uh, what are your thoughts in terms of this match? Uh, is this a homecoming for Livingston? No, they just had their long homecoming okay. last weekend. And I believe they, they won that uh, as a lot of folks was cheering that they – uh, in some people's minds, kind of one that upset Fayetteville State hadn't done it in a while, mm, um, well, and it was on homecoming weekend. Well, I mean, I think the big thing for, for Livingston is uh, the question for me is can they stop Trayvon Hester? I think one of the things that uh, Winston-Salem State has been able to do this past season, they've been able to run the ball. They've got great quarterback play from Dalen Lee. Uh, he's one of those guys you see week in, week out, who throws, who's been throwing for over 200 yards. Uh, and, and multiple touchdowns. So the question for me is, can you stop Winston-Salem State's offense? Going to be a tough one for Livingston. I'm going to take the Rams in this one. Winston, let me go to you and your thoughts in terms of this top seven matchup. Uh, what do you say about what's going on between uh, Blue Bears and the Rams in North Carolina? Uh, so when I when I look at this, I, I think Winston-Salem State would, uh, would get this win. I don't really see – well, I know Livingstone is coming off of the win uh, this past weekend, which, like I said, it was somewhat of a surprise. But I like the way that uh, Dalen Lee is playing. I also like the way their running back is, is playing. Their defense also stands out too. So I'm looking for Winston-Salem State to get that win as well. Eddie hey, Drew, your thoughts on the matchup, key matchup in the CIAA race? Um, everybody's trying to make sure they stay in contention. You can't afford to take this second loss in conference play. I'm looking at uh, Livingstone's uh, schedule, and I'm kind of like uh, Wilson is with certain teams. <laughs> Livingstone, I still need a, I still need more data points with Livingstone. Yeah. Let's look. Let's look at who they beat. They haven't played any heavy hitters yet. Virgi yeah, Virginia, Virginia Lynchburg, Allen, Bowie State, Lincoln, PA. <laughs> Elizabeth City. Fayetteville was their first real matchup. Real matchup. <laughs> dolly, dolly. They passed it. Yeah. But was that was that a blip on the radar? You know, anybody could get up from one game. What so now? Home for home coming to your point. Exactly. Yeah. Can, 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 you, can you get up for two games in a row? Or do you need to go to the doctor and get you one of the blue pills so you can get up a second time? <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> so I'm going with this. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, oh, if you like, hey, hey, you I'm glad it's not a family show. show. With that being said, yeah, that was a good one. That was a good one. Yeah, well. <laughs> Let's get into this matchup. Don't even know where they came from, man. <laughs> hey. Sometimes it just happens like that. <laughs> yeah, that one locked and loaded. Man. He did. He did. We have a team just outside of the top seven. Essentially, it would be number nine. That's the Shaw Bears. They face Johnson C. Smith, the number one team. As we told you, they're for real six and second weeks. Shaw just had a tough loss. Can they bounce back? And they would have to do this on the road at Charlotte. Uh, it's a 1 p.m. Eastern game, so that means high noon for us in the central uh, time zone. You have Shaw sitting at four and three, two and two, and they face up against John C. Smith that's undefeated, six and oh, three and oh in the conference race. Uh, what are your thoughts on this matchup? Sticking with you, Drew, uh, what's your, your, your thoughts on the Golden Bulls? Can the Bears have the shock, shock, the upset of the year? That's pretty much what it would be at this point in time. It would be the, the upset of the year. We know Shaw, uh, has the ability to play in big games. We saw what they did to Albany State early in the season. But that was early in the season, y'all. Mm -hmm. That was real early in the season. Shaw has played good, but they have kind of they've they've kind of regressed a little bit. Coming off that loss to uh Winston Salem, you know, Johnson C having had a week off. To, to refresh themselves to get to get ready for this stretch run, I don't think this is a good time for Shaw to be going up against a team like Johnson C. Smith. 
coming coming up off the bye, especially the way Johnson C. Smith like lo- loves to run the ball. So it's yeah. gonna, it's gonna it's it's gonna be interesting. The only way Shaw has a chance, Shaw has to play from out front. Shaw cannot play from behind in oh, this yeah. particular matchup. Mm-hmm. Well, then let me go to you. I'm gonna just be honest. Johnson C. Smith's defense is real. Yeah. And because it's real, I think Christian Peters is probably going to have a hard day facing that defense on Saturday. Not going to lie to you. Um, and I also think to the fact of, like, obviously, Justin C. Smith got past Winston-Salem. And then, you know, of course, Winston-Salem beat Shaw. So I'm thinking to myself, and to Drew's point, Justin, I, I, I even stronger Justin C. Smith team coming off of a bye with a quarterback like Darius Ocean, who's probably locked and loaded and will be ready on Saturday, I don't see them losing that game. Charles? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's going to be Johnson C. Smith in this game, but the, the puncher's chance that I do give, but I, I think, A.D., you kind of touched on it, is the fact that uh, Shaw does like to run the ball, and I would think that they need to throw the ball a little bit more in this game. One thing, Johnson C. Smith, although they have a great defense, they don't really have a lot of sacks. They're in the middle of the pack with regards to getting to the quarterback. So if Shaw can, like you said, can, can they kind of chunk the ball around a little bit, play from out in front? It gives them a puncher's chance, but I still think the Bulls will get this one. Last game in the mid-major features uh, a 5-7 matchup out of the SIC. Uh, it is a game in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Birmingham's finest, Fairfield to be specific. Miles Golden Bears travels over to Atlanta uh, to feature the Panthers. Another big matchup. Uh, Miles has had Clark Atlanta at number, as everybody seems to have, but this is a different Clark Atlanta team, different quarterback. Different coach, they certainly have some confidence. Uh, but this is a true test. Uh, this will go down probably as the game that's going to have one of these teams for sure in the championship game matchup. Obviously, a couple of things can happen. You do have that Tuskegee Miles game and some other ones out there, but this will go a long way if nothing else. So, Charles, what are your thoughts in terms of this matchup with number seven, Miles Golden Bears at 4 and 2, 4 and 0 oh in the conference race at the top? Uh, going into Atlanta to face the number five, Clark Atlanta Panthers, five and one and one overall, four and one in the conference race. Big time matchup. Mm-hmm. I'm excited about this one. It is Clark Atlanta's homecoming. Woo! So that is going to make sure they have some intrigue in it. I think the tickets early were twenty twenty five dollars. My understanding at the last count, this was as of yesterday, the tickets were going for sixty dollars. And get sixty dollar tickets, and they dialed up the wrong team for homecoming. Cause <laughs> this, 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 you don't want to see a team that can run the football number one and keep your offense off the field. And then the other thing that jumps out for me: this Miles defense gets after you. They're number two in the conference in sacks. They're yep. number one in interceptions for a team that likes to throw the ball forty plus times a game. It plays right in the Miles' hands. So. I'm taking the Bears on the road. Wilton, and I think I slipped and I heard, must have said Winston or something over there, and I probably was thinking about some TV show or something. I apologize. I don't even realize I said it, but Wilton Jackson, the second, let me make sure I say it loud and clear for everybody. Wilton, call him Winston if you want to. You're going to get the wrong. (laughs) Brother Jackson. The second, tell me what your thoughts on this match. Now, you know, Dr. Cavill, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be a little biased here. I like both teams. Mm-hmm. I would love to see Clark Atlanta win for homecoming. I really would because I have really gotten behind the job that Coach Keaton has done with this program. I do understand what Miles is bringing to the table to Charles' point, his data point that he talked about the defense because even last week they came into that game, they were like third in scoring defense, total defense, uh, third even in pass defense. Num- them numbers and num- the players that they have on that defense is not going to change within a week. Will it be a challenge in them, you know, being able to slow down David Wright? Of course it will be. Um, but if I had to say, I'm probably going to I'm probably gonna have to go with Miles, sadly. But I I want to I want to pull the clock and to get this win on homecoming, but I, I think Miles' defense is going to be the deciding factor. See, you just went back to Winston. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, Wilton. Good, good analysis and very fair. I'm with you, you're right. This is a tough matchup for Miles. Yeah. I mean, for Clark Atlanta. It'll be interesting to see 
how far they've gotten in terms of what they built for the program. So it's a perfect test if you want to be seriously a contender for the championship. This is a game that you got to find a way to win. But I think most of the experts are going to look at Miles Golden Bears. Uh, they got off to a slow start, but now they're moving forward. I want to see what uh, the SIC guru, D2, extravagant uh, AD Drew has to say about this matchup. I have to, obvious for obvious reasons. I have to walk a fine line when talk. We're talking about this particular matchup. True, very uh, true. Do it, be, you know, because well, tip -toe, let's see, let's see. <laughs> you know, Clark Atlanta is my rival. Clark Atlanta is my neighbor. Right, Biles is my former rival. Biles is my former neighbor. So, uh, but. You know, it it is going to be uh, uh, interesting to see. Does Miles stay with the running game to try to keep that Clark Atlanta offense off of the That's field? Uh, also, Clark Atlanta's defense the last two three weeks has gotten they they're, they're better than they were at the start of the season. They, they, I mean, they're not top five or anything like that. But they they are they are playing a, a little bit better. Uh, the problem is as the defense has uh, got a little better, the offense has slowed down a little bit mm. at Clark Atlanta for uh, the last three games. You know, there was a point in time Clark Atlanta and under forty, you didn't didn't even cross your mind. Now you you hoping that they get back to forty, yeah. So mm. so that uh, so that they have a chance. And by I was giving up forty. I I, I would, you really want to want to see that. So obviously, I'm not going to pick anybody in this particular game, but I want to leave you guys with this with this thought. When we look back in around Christmas time, early January, we look back at this season. Will we mark the third Saturday in October this year as the as the turning point in the season for a lot of teams, where teams are going to be made? Or, or broken this particular weekend because with so many big matchups this weekend on both levels, I think this is the weekend when we say that team won the championship game or uh, that team vaulted the championship or uh, that team was uh, knocked themselves out of contention. This is going to be the weekend that we look back at. I agree with you. Great points. Let's take our last break. We'll come back on the other side. Finishing thoughts with the major game of the week. Seriously, it's the major division game of the week, as we talk about on this um, show. Uh, it features top 25 teams, top four teams in these poll rankings. Everybody's top one or two team in this matchup. It all belongs to the SWAC. It's been the team that won this game the last three years has come out of the championship game and went on into the celebration bowl. It will be interesting to see what happens this week. This time, it's not in Miami. It's at home in Jackson, Mississippi. We'll be right back after this last one. At Auto Masters LLC, our mission is to serve our community by providing quality automobiles at affordable prices. All of our vehicles are inspected and certified to offer you the confidence in knowing you have a quality vehicle. Our goal is to provide you with a seamless process and positive experience for your automobile purchase. Financing recommendations and specific vehicle inquiries are available at your request. You can find us at www.automasters06.com and like, follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Also, please feel free to contact Terrence Miles at 601-927 Seven seven nine four, and oh yeah, tell him Sonia sent you. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team if they want a lot yeah, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor uh, Yes Sir, yes, and pay attention boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Will inside the HBC Sports Lab. Boy, those texts that go back and forth doing <laughs> I told you I made my message. I still see the text. I said what I said. He's, I'm stand, like, he's standing on business. I apologize. <laughs> he said, apologies. And then he messed up, and I told him. 
He go earn that name. Now <laughs> let's, get, let's get into the big matchup. Uh, what y'all really wanted to talk about anyway is y'all uh, entertaining me with all the other mid-major stuff. I appreciate that for the first 45 minutes of the show. But I know y'all want to get into the big boys talk. That's the major division, the game of the week. Uh, let's just start it off and get right into it, Charles. What, what are your thoughts? What are you looking at? What is your concerns from both teams' perspectives? Uh, what do you think needs to take place when you look at this matchup? Again, this is a matchup that features a three versus floor four in terms of the major division rankings uh, that came out this past Sunday. Sure. Uh, what concerns me with Jackson State uh, is the way they play in the fourth quarter, whether they're up or, or whether they're uh, behind or whatever the case might be. How they look in the fourth quarter is going to be huge to me uh, because – uh, we've seen uh, Florida a and with that championship pedigree. We've seen them close the show, if you will. Uh, we've seen Jackson State uh, be up big and then sort of take their foot off the gas. So that's that's a, a concern for me. Uh, and then, quite honestly, uh, can, can Jackson State protect the football? Uh, I think that's the, the big thing. And their loss uh, to Grambling, that was the bugaboo. Uh, so that's something that jumps out uh, to me with regards to Jackson State. Uh, on the flip side, I think, you know, uh, Florida a is going to have to run the ball. Uh, and if they become one-dimensional, I think that plays into Jackson State's hands. they got some guys that can fly off the edge and can really give uh, uh, FAMU's quarterbacks uh, some, some nice issues back there. So those are the things that jump out to me. And then I'm going to throw one more thing out there for FAMU because I think this has transformed tremendously over the past – probably five years, the vet truly is a 12th man now. Uh, and uh, that the atmosphere, the environment is going to be different. Uh, and I, I give a lot of credit to Jackson State's uh, uh, operation staff with regards to the stadium. They engage the fan base now, especially on third downs. Uh, the student section is in your ear. I, I think that 12th man, uh, if it, it gets into the fourth quarter, that's going to be a huge thing for Jackson State. Yes, I know we had the question, was this game on television? It has been flexed from ESPN Plus to ESPN U. So it is a television televised contest on ESPN U to answer that question. Going to you, Winston. Uh, you won <laughs> FCS top 25 ranking 18 versus 25. Family was ranked uh, at 18, Jackson State at 25. Um, so, either way you look at it, this is a big time matchup with a lot on the line, uh, in versus in very different ways. Not only are you talking about taking control of the east, but what we see going on in the west. Uh, would make you think that this game and whoever comes out of this game has a large leg in terms of hosting the SWAT championship game. And since we've seen it being host on campus, we haven't seen a visiting team win that game. Yeah. Um, so you go back to that as well. This is significant in terms of what that comes down, not to add on the financial incentives associated with hosting a home football game for either one of these teams. What's your thoughts? I think that this game, just for starters, this game being in Jackson is huge for Jackson State. Uh, again, when you play in these neutral site venues, it's like, okay, your fan base is going to travel. And rightfully so with FAMU and Jackson State, those are two fan bases that travel. But kind of to Charles' point, when you talk about playing in the vet, fans are going to come out. They know what it's like to play FAMU. They've also seen – you know, Jackson State lose to FAMU, uh, you know, last year. So that's something that fans and or players haven't forgot about. But as far as like X's and O's and on the football field, I think I'm looking forward to see which one of these teams is going to control the line of scrimmage. Like to, to the point of will Jacoby and Morgan have the time that he needs to throw the ball? Will fam, you put pressure on Jacoby and Morgan? Yeah. Will Jackson State be able to uh, limit Daniel Richardson's chances in, in scrambling and extending plays? Will they force fam you to run the ball? Will they be able to stop the run? Yeah. You know, will fam you be able to stop Jackson State's rushing attack? Because I feel like if it's ever been a game where Jackson State truly probably will need to run the ball, it's got to it, be this one. It is definitely this game. Yeah. Good stuff. Good analysis. 
Yeah, Mr. Winston Jackson the <laughs> second. <laughs> That's my new name. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start putting Winston on here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but Wilton Jackson the first might get upset. <laughs> yeah, you know what? He, he, he probably he'd be like, he, well, I can't even say some words he'd say. <laughs> I, I named you after me for a reason. Exactly. <laughs> I told you, Wilton. I was, I was going to let him make it until he, he sent me all these ugly text messages. <laughs> <laughs> it's a so I'm like, well, let's flip it. Let's make it into a show. AD Drew. I'm not going to re, uh, reiterate the points that I made on Sunday. So I'm going to bring up some new points. <laughs> a, FAMU this year has only two interceptions. You know, A, you talk about uh, the passing game for Jackson State, which we know Jackson State likes to run the ball. FAMU only has 10 sacks. And has only uh, had two interceptions this year. So when Jackson State does decide to pass the ball, can Fam you put any any type of pressure on Jackson State and and cause some cause a cause turnover, cause some havoc, get some hurries, things of that nature. On the flip side, uh, Jackson State sixteen sacks on the season, four interceptions. So can Daniel Richardson? You know, continue to do what he what he has uh, been doing this entire season for Famu offensively, uh, as as he's been more than uh, capable of a manager of the game. Mm-hmm. Also, the other thing in a game like this, you have to play the field position game. Mm-hmm. Famu's statistically, Famu's punter is slightly better than. Jackson State's punter by about two yards. Both of them only had one touchback, but Jackson State's punter has down has gotten the ball down inside the twenty more often than FAMU's punter. And when it comes to when it comes to field goals, Jackson State's field goal kicker is eight for nine on the season. I'm sorry, I, I if I pull up the name, let me see if I can pull up his name right quick. Gerard, just, Gerardo Bezos. Bezos. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, because I I, I, it was, I knew it was one of them names. I had to see it. I wasn't going to ever remember it. <laughs> <laughs> Just call him G-Baby. G-Baby. Yeah. Well, G-Baby. Yeah. Whereas, whereas uh, Cam- Cameron Gillis is, uh, is is seven of eight on, on the season. Uh, uh, say that name again, Charles. Gerardo Basin. Yeah. Okay, G Baby has a long of forty five. Yeah, where Gillis go. has a long of forty three this year, but Fam does have somebody back there, Michael Smith, who can kick fifty yard field goals. He's kicked a forty nine yarder this season. So if it comes down to that at the end, slight advantage, Fam, you on a long field goal. But if you if you talk about accuracy, getting just outside the red zone. Advantage Jackson State. So, just a couple other things I wanted to throw out there for people to uh, consider outside. Can't fame you stop the damn run. Yeah, I like it when you talk about uh, the breakdown and getting a little bit of special teams. Uh, Wilton really got into um, talking about the key matchups, several different facets. Could it get done by either team? Uh, what's necessary? Things that they want to do. Will they be able to impose themselves on the other team? And Charles does um, the inside perspective of really giving you uh, the big picture in terms of the atmosphere. Will fam, you be ready to take on Jackson State in this particular atmosphere? Had a big test, good one against Alabama State, but because of what took place, uh, their offensive side of the ball, um, this is just the next level of that, especially when you talk about rankings and all these things. The game being flexed from ESPN+. Plus. The ESPNU tells you the magnitude of what's taking place here. And it's always fascinating to see how young men uh, test and attribute their skills when they have to adjust to that magnitude of the game. They've been in it many times before. Some of them be slightly new, but it'll be interesting to see what their likes looks like. Obviously, uh, top-notch coaches on both sides of the ball that are really cutting their teeth, getting the imprint on their own program. So it's fascinating to see who will have the edge in that framework. With that being said, let's I'm, call it. I'm, I'm, curious, I'm curious what the attendance might be. Uh, Mississippi State Fair is in town uh, this weekend as well. 
Well, it's uh, done now. Oh, it's done now. Yeah, okay. yeah it's done. Well, yeah. that that oh. that rules that out there. So yeah, yeah. I was well, thinking about you were saying that would have helped or hurt. I think that would have that would have helped because that oh, becomes goodness. sort of a thing uh, that draws right. people into Jackson. Uh, additional yeah, folks didn't necessarily yeah. would do that. A good point. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Thank uh, you plus for the minus 50, Charles. What you just what you think? Under. Under. Yeah. Gotcha. Good stuff. Good question. Thank you for listening to Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share a podcast with your friends and colleagues. These guys don't know they're in front of me getting to the pool. I am Dr. Yadika <laughs> Levine, HBC Sports from inside the the lab inside the College of HBC Sports with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Uh, again, I hope you enjoyed the show with all the great information, unveiling of the mid-major poll rankings and updates on the major games of the week. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Bill's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop every Tuesday and Thursday. We'll be back on Thursday at 6 o'clock. I'll be back home uh, giving you the updates live from Houston as we normally do. Uh, we look forward to next week as we discuss the latest news uh, in the lab on Thursday. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Bill. That's on Twitter. I call it Twitter because I can. Facebook, Instagram, D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. Inside the HBC Sports Lab 1 on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube is Inside the HBC Sports Lab. With that being said, drink big. Continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon as we get into this matchup. I'm finna start cheat code. Charles? Of course. Wilton? Lexer. Drew? Dismissed. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wrong, wrong, wrong view. There we go. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.